connection to the material and that's what my process is as well I mean you read a comic book and you know you need to have some sort of something in you that is sparked by the material and specifically the paper girls it was these 14 girls who aren't mean who are nice to each other who support each other and they're lost in this horrible time warp and um, that's what I was really interested in the story I was interested in telling and for the boys, frankly, it's just the fact that these superheroes are so mean. <laughs> and I can buy that. I can buy into that too. Uh, uh, ditto on the uh, on the emotional content because without that, you, you just got you know some cool panels. Um, but the emotion, I think, really makes it resonate and makes it a show that people will want to watch and relate to. Um, and I think the other thing about comics in general is you have great visuals, and you can choose to use those visuals or not as a way to inform how you're making your show or your movie, but there's something that's really great about seeing someone else's vision and trying to then translate that onto the screen. Well, adaptations are extremely tricky. You know, with comic books, animation, there's already a fan base. There's already like a huge fan base following the comic books, and um, you know, how did you decide to 
what to keep from this comic book, what to grab from the comic book, the graphic novel, but also still make it your own story because you don't want to just go direct, but it's also, you want to create your own story from this. Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, it was, uh, you know, I was a part of that fan base. Uh, I, Adrian Tomina is like one of my favorite graphic novelists. Uh, uh, well, you know, is my favorite and was my favorite, and uh, so I was such a big fan of his work. And this book in particular uh, uh, was something that was just very special to me. So, so um, uh, I, I wanted to do right by Adrian and the book, uh, uh, but I also, uh, and this was something that I talked to with Adrian early on. We wanted to make sure that this wasn't the book. You know, that this was. Uh, 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 that this could stand on its own. And, and also the book would, had been written 15 years before, so all this time had changed. Uh, Adrian had changed during that time. I had changed as a, a, a fan of the work. You know, we, we all grew up a bit, and, and we wanted to, uh, you know, infuse the, this project with our kind of evolved perspectives, you know, and, and uh, uh, so that, so it really, yeah, it became a, a let, let's make sure, because the graphic novel is going to make its way into the, the movie anyway. I mean, it's an adaptation. So let, let's, let's detach ourselves from, from, you know, from every panel of the graphic novel and just focus on making a movie. And uh, uh, so I didn't even look at it. I didn't, like, as soon as I signed on to be a director, I was like, I'm not going to look at the graphic novel. It's already kind of <laughs> seared into my mind. I'm not going to look at it. Uh, I'm just going to focus on the script. And uh, uh, on the movie, and then, uh, yeah, that's that's how we kind of got into it. Okay. Um, the fans are super important to us. At every show I do that's got a graphic novel um, IP, and um, it's super important. And we want to make sure that we're giving them an adaptation of the novel, the graphic novel that they love. However, it's a graphic novel, and we're making TV shows or movies. And, you know, we also have an obligation to, uh, you know, represent that story in a different medium. And um, fortunately, the creators like Brian K. Vaughn and Cliff Chang of Paper Girls, they were so generous about saying, here's the story, here's what we put down there, and now make it your own and tell our story a different way. So are you, are you telling me that One Piece has a large fan base? <laughs> <laughs> It, it was absolutely the most daunting thing I've ever done. <laughs> and, and the expectation was so huge. And I knew that if, if we messed it up, that people would be hunting for me. <laughs> so certainly uh, there was that pressure. But that being said, it was also an interesting challenge and, and one that, that required all, uh, four years of my life um, uh, putting into it. But the, I would say that the big thing for me was also trying to find a balance between hewing to the, the source manga, because obviously the source is, is terribly important to the fans, and then also doing a show that new people could come and watch and enjoy without knowing what One Piece is, and just say, hey, what is this crazy show with pink pirate ships and, and <laughs> kids with stretchy powers? Um, <laughs> and finding a way to appeal to both, and if you did it right, the show was going to be very successful. If you did it wrong, no one was going to like it. So that was, it's, it's definitely a challenge, and it's a challenge, I think, with any adaptation, is how far do you do the source material and how far do you get away from it? Yeah, well, all of it was great, and I follow, I, I read the source material and been following along with that. And, um, but there are so many cases, especially when you add sci-fi elements, um, the paper girls and the powers from one piece, the stretch powers. Um, we're adapting the scene from, like, we're, what has been difficult in adapting that source? Like, the, the power source or uh, the sci-fi aspects. Were there difficulties in adapting the sci-fi from the book and from the comic book to, you know, the screen? Um, especially not to make it gimmicky, to kind of make sure that it kind of adapted well from animation to, to, the, to the big screen. What would you say the most difficult part of it? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, the, the powers uh, in One Piece were really challenging, and we did a lot of proof of concept work to try and make sure that we were doing the best version of that. But I'll give you a perfect example, which is the stretchy power. We've all seen stretchy power before. Um, a 
lot of times it doesn't look very good, and I knew that we were going to get the best possible visual effects that we could get on it, but we also made some choices, which I think worked for the most part, about how to portray stretchy powers. For example, we never let them go across the screen this way or that way, or rarely. It was always toward and away from the screen, yeah. and that helped a little bit, I think, and not really having to be able to stop and analyze what it looked like. And the second thing was we made it fast, and again, trying to minimize the amount of time that the stretchy arm or leg was on the screen by having it really be elastic and snap. And so that was just like kind of a practical way of taking something that was very in a very important effect and having it not suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've also seen that about the sci-fi aspect of, of Paper Girls. Would you say that, how was it from the screen to kind of bring that to life to you? Well, you know, not to be too blunt about it, but drawing a spaceship's a lot easier than creating. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a, I'm not gonna say it wasn't inexpensive, but um, a spaceship, if we built it practically, we would have blown our whole budget on just that one set. And a lot of it was visual effects, especially in episode eight. Um, but you know, I, I gotta be honest, there are certain limits that I had to abide by because we had a certain budget that we were given. We we're grateful for that budget, but um, you know, in terms of servicing the sci-fi show, um, we just had to really pick and choose how we spent it and where we spent it. Um, you know, like there's a, there's a sequence where the sky turns purple. That purple sky costs money. Because in visual effects, some artist is in there making it purple. So it's like, okay, well, let's find some shots that don't see the sky. You know, put the camera up here, look down, you know, stuff like that. And they're easy solutions, but um, it's something that you just, we just have to keep it in the back of our mind constantly because the sci-fi is pretty expensive to produce for TV. Yeah. Well, Randall, congrats on your directorial debut. Um, well, you first read the script of uh, the, the graphic novel in 2007 uh, when it first came out. And I read that you initially wanted this to be made during that time with you in the role of Ben. But of course, 2007 was a different time. How has the story changed, significantly changed for you since 2007 to now? Does that affect how you wanted to tell the story? Um, well, I got old. I <laughs> <laughs> told the story. Right. Uh, well, back then, when I first read the graphic novel, I was, I was like, you know, I was, I was in, into my acting career and, uh, uh, and very much struggling. And uh, I remember reading the graphic novel and just thinking, oh my god, what a great character. You know, this character. Is so, this character is like is so complicated and uh, and so flawed and 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 I thought, wow, what a great character, you know, to play. I wish I could. I I, I would love to play this character. And uh, uh, and then over the years, I thought, I wonder if anyone's going to make a you know project out of this. And I keep, you know kind of look into it, and no one was. And uh, uh, and then eventually, you know, I, I kind of went on with my acting career and. and uh, I always thought of the story uh, and the, the book, and, and, and then 15 years later, I kind of got to a place where I, I could actually possibly direct it, you know, a feature version. So that's how that that happened. And at that point, I was uh, uh, way too old to play. And, uh, but, um, what was the question? <laughs> Um, how has the story significantly changed for you from 2007 to kind of building it to now? Uh, I mean, I don't think it had changed too much at its heart. You know, at its heart, it was, the, I mean, the things that I loved about it was it really was a story about personal growth. And it was about these characters who kind of suck. And, <laughs> uh, and they're all just trying their best to, to be better, to do better. And, and, and the lead character, Ben, particularly sucks and, and <laughs> is having a very hard time. And so he's kind of forced to, to look at himself in the mirror. And that was always at the heart of it. So, I mean, really the things that, that did change were, were uh, you know, just specific things like, the, you know, the times and the, the technology of the time that the book was written it was very different, you know. Uh, there in the graphic novel, there's a lot of slamming down of telephones. You know, like, can't really do. You know, and it's not very dramatic to go like that. You know, uh, uh, amongst other like kind of just social norms and, and attitudes that that have changed uh, significantly since then. So, um, 
So we really went about it to you know keep the heart, but uh, address all of those those things that have changed over time that that play into the story in a lot of ways. You know, so it was about figuring out uh, creative ways to 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 tell this, uh, the same story, but to do it in a modern context without it feeling like, and, and to still make it feel organic and, and, and natural and, and subtle and not too, you know, like, uh, uh, like we were trying too hard to, to, to contextualize it to today. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay, well, with Karen, you worked on a few comic book adaptations, The Boys, Paper Girls, The Walking Dead, and a few superhero series um, that stem from comic books like Supergirl, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., G Gotham, um, and my favorite, Shadow and Bone. Uh, <laughs> when working on these series as a director, do you look at into the source material to tell the story and work with the amazing writers and showrunners to flesh it out? Especially when it comes to something like The Boys, where it's so graphic and so visceral, and, uh, and they don't hold back on the violence and the explicit scenes. Um, I, 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 I'm familiar with the source material, but honestly, if I'm if I get an episode and I get a great script, which I've been blessed with, like the writers I've worked with are so good. Um, Eric Kripke from The Boys, uh, Stephanie Folsom from Paper Girls, they're just sensational writers. Um, I, I stop looking at the graphic novel because, as I said before, that's a graphic novel, and I'm making a TV show. It's a whole different thing, and we've already gotten the blessing from the creator of the novel, that we can make it our own, but just honor the spirit of the story. Um, and, um, you know, they, I don't look at it. But I do work really closely with the writers. First of all, it's their script, it's their vision. Having said that, um, they hired me to bring my ideas and my vision into it. And it's really cool when you can collaborate so closely and so um, well with, um, with really great writers. It's, it's three quarters of the battle. Well, Steve, we know One Piece is a cultural phenomenon uh, with over a thousand episodes plus, a thousand plus episodes in county. Um, the manga and the anime has been translated in so many languages. You know, I, I don't doubt there's, there's maybe a little bit of pressure. Maybe not, maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I was wondering, have you finished the One Piece manga and anime yet? And then two, with the uh, world of One Piece being so vast, um, you know, and having only eight episodes to fill it up, how did you decide what was important for the season? First question, no, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially in the anime. Um, but the manga, I have read up through Wano, so I'm, I'm getting there. Um, yeah. and, uh, it's just so much fun to, to see where Osan's imagination will, will take us next. Um, as far as, as choosing, that was a big part of the battle. Um, in, in making the show was trying to decide how much of it to put in. And it seemed like East Blue was a natural kind of breaking point and stopping point for the first episode. And so about almost everything out of East Blue, if we had had 10 episodes, we would have included Logetown, but unfortunately <laughs> had the eight. And it just felt like it would be cramming in at that point. So a lot of it was kind of determining what felt like a natural breaking point for a, a first season. And the second thing was on emotional arcs for everybody. The fact that Nami's arc kind of begins and ends uh, at Arlong Park, which was our episode eight, felt like a real natural way to tell that story. And then also to give Luffy a journey through that in our version, uh, in our adaptation, we also used Toby to mirror that. And so it was taking those characters and making sure they had a, a nice emotional arc through the show. And then also not going on too many travels. We didn't go to Diamond's Island, for example. Uh, it was, it was just too small and felt like we just didn't have the real estate for it, unfortunately. Uh, we wanted to, uh, but, but ended up kind of cherry picking moments from the first hundred or so, 95, 90 chapters, to, that had the, the, the best kind of overall journey for a season of television, and then also had the emotional arcs as well. So you could really feel like you got to know these characters and understood where they came from and why they were acting the way they were. Well, thank you guys so much, but I, I want to note too, because you guys came from IT, original IPs, you know, uh, these IPs belong to the writers and creators of the original stories. What was it like working with them? Was there any pushback? Was there any questions? Did you, did they want input on, on certain scenes and everything? 
with um, Paper Girls, Brian and Cliff, and then uh, Adrian for Shortcomings, and Ichiro for One Piece. Were there any situations where they wanted their say as well? Um, I'll have to see. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, Osan is a very um, uh, direct and challenging man. And, and, and to be fair, he is a genius and he created this wonderful world that's been going on now 25 plus seasons. Um, it's his sandbox and I just feel fortunate that I get to play in it. Um, that being said, we had disagreements um, and very, very passionate discussions about whether things should be pulled forward or back or this character or that character. And a lot of it was trying to make the case for, uh, again, because it's a season of television and not 85, 90 chapters of a manga, um, what was okay to move and what was not. And so this was the compromised version of it because um, he, it, was, it was very much about trying to convince him that um, this was the right way to do the, the first season of television. And um, luckily he agreed and was a, a great supporter all the way. Brian K. Vaughn and Cliff Chang were super great. Um, they were with us for the ride, but they did not act as our overseer because they, as I said, they wanted us to tell their story, but bring what, you know, enhance it. So in fact, uh, reading the IP for Paper Girls, um, we actually uh, stretched it all out. Like we told each girl's story in the course of the eight episodes. And, um, and that's not in the uh, IP, but you know, it was with their blessing. And um, as far as working with the writers, they're great. I mean, um, on Paper Girls, I was also a producer. So, uh, you know, I bring a lot of ideas to the table and you know, they'd say yes, no. It's, all, it's a process, you all agree on stuff. Um, with the boys, um, Eric Kripke has that vision in his head, and he's super great at it. He's created a great show, and um, so I wanted to fulfill his vision, but you know, when I had ideas, he always listened. He's a great collaborator. It's just he has more of a form formulated idea of what he wants. But you know, both of them are great. Um, yeah, going into uh, the movie, or when I got hired for the movie, I, I was one of my big trepidations was working with Adrian because uh, I didn't know him. I, I just knew his work, and I was such a big fan of his work. And I, I had always thought that in shortcomings, that Ben, who the main character, who was this just a jerk, um, <laughs> I, I, I had always assumed that he was this thinly veiled version of the writer, you know. And uh, so I was like, oh, this guy's gonna be a dick. <laughs> I know it, I know it. Uh, uh, and, and for two years, we had to develop the script together, you know, because he, there was a script that he wrote, uh, but uh, it, you know, it was, it was a script that he had written a long time before and it needed to, you know, all those things that we had talked about earlier be kind of modernized and be kind of uh, uh, made a little more into a, a proper movie. On top of that, it was an ind you know, very independent film, and we had a, issues with budget, and the, the, you know, the rewrites had to address all of those issues that we had uh, uh, facing us. And uh, uh, I gotta say, he, Adrian's amazing. He's like the, he's like the nicest guy, they, a very, uh, I mean, he, he definitely is a real art, a serious artist who knows what he, you know, likes and knows what he wants. And, uh, but with that, he was extremely collab collaborative, very open, uh, and just a, just a great guy. So it was, it was really like cool, you know, just like working with him and becoming friends with him and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, getting through it together. And, and um, it was really important to me that, because, you know, with, with, with film, it's a little different. It's like kind of writers get screwed you know, in, in the movie process. It's like they, they write the thing and then and then the director takes it and the production kind of just runs off with it. You know, the writer kind of just gets left behind. That's, the, that's usually what happens, you know. The writers usually aren't allowed to be on set. They're just kind of, thank you for your script. Now we're gonna do what we're gonna do with it. Uh, uh, but it was really important to me that, that he, you know, be, be proud of the movie and that he, you know, knew what was going on and, and that, you know, his suggestions were always, you know, taken into uh, account and, uh, and yeah, it was, it was great. It was great. Well, there's something to be said about these stories that do involve identity, um, like in shortcomings, and then stories that are based on Japanese manga. 
um, were there any pushbacks or expectations from the studios to kind of westernize things, like to like make it less of an identity, to make it um, more pleasing for audiences who don't watch the manga, or kind of did kind of push back from identity issues or anything regarding the, uh, Jap Japanese culture added in there? I guess I could go. Um, no, not push back so much. Um, Differences of opinion sometimes, um, and yes, we had many cultural conversations because um, uh, one piece of the Japanese manga and, and was written by a Japanese man, and so he has a certain set of cultural values, and they may you know differ in some ways from our cultural values, and so a lot of it was trying to find that middle ground um, and trying to come up with a show that was going to please a Japanese audience. Um, but at the same time, also please an international audience. And so it was very gratifying to see that the show was very, did very well in Asia. The show did very well in South America. The show did well in the, in the United States as well. But it, it's so, so interesting to see the fan base of that show is so widely spread out. Um, and, and it truly is an international show, uh, which we hope to, to translate into live action as well. And Randall, because, you know, I know that they initially Wanted, like they wanted to kind of take this movie in, in, throughout the time of it to kind of westernize it, make it a white guy or something. Yeah, well, early on, yeah. early, before I even became a part of it, there were uh, Adrian just told the story of yeah. Uh, shortly after the graphic novel came out, there was uh, interest in in, the, in Hollywood and, and uh, talks of uh, can you can you make this more ca quote unquote castable, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he was like no. And how you know, and if, if you're familiar with the graphic novel, how, how can you? How, you can't do that, you know. It's like such a, it's such a, you know, uh, uh, important part of. Uh, it's not like overtly about identity, but but it, it is a kind of underneath it all. It it, it is very much about uh, identity uh, and other other things. So, uh, but you know, by the you know, 15 years later, it's like. You know, most of our uh, most of our well, all of our financiers and, and uh, a good percentage of our production producing team they, they were white, you know, and uh, they they couldn't really say anything <laughs> 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 because uh, and, they, and they were very you know good about that. It's like they weren't going to tell us how to deal with identity, American identity, and uh, 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 which is yeah, which was which was good. <laughs> That's our favorite in, me in the meeting rooms. Like, oh yeah, it, like I feel like our identity is like this. Oh, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. Yeah, I think the industry uh, has has been trained at this point uh, to to you know let let hire people from those communities to to consider those kind of those types of things you know, for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we do see an emergence of books to films, uh, to TV, uh, comic books, manga, uh, anime, and video games becoming more like television series for the West, like for mainstream and also in film. Um, you know, do you feel like but while working on these properties, do you feel like this is the future of mainstream media? Are we kind of grabbing, are you seeing more like, hey, we want this ad 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 um, adapted? Hey, are you looking into this story? Or are there other stories that you want to adapt from? books and, and other mediums? Um, I, I would say yes, I certainly hope so. Um, it's, it's wonderful that um, source material from all over the world can now be adapted for international shows. I think it's great. Um, I hope that, that we get to see more. And I hope that the manga and anime space certainly gets to open up. And, um, you know, every show does not necessarily need a live ad action adaptation, but a lot, it's pretty, wonderful to consider those possibilities and so I hope that studios and streamers are opening their minds to uh, to the possibilities of that. Um, yeah, I agree with what Steve said. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think it's great that we're pulling from so many international sources to make movies <coughs> or TV shows we all want to watch, but, you know, look at Barbie. That's an original script based on a doll. Like, I would never have figured out how to make that a movie. And my hat's off to Greta Gerwig for creating that whole pink world and 
it was, it was sensational what she did. And um, so I sure hope that, you know, along with our, all the IP and the graphic novels and stuff that we're seeing on screen, that we continue to see more original ideas. Mm -hmm. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, thank you guys so much, and we're gonna have an uh, open Q and A. Um, I know we had we, we I know we had so many questions, so I want to make sure if anyone else has questions out there. So we and then we'll have the, our person come with the microphone. I'll have oh, oh we'll start right up there. The questions for Randall. Um, how? What sort of advantages and disadvantages did your acting background have as you uh, became a director and embarked on? Uh, we were just talking about that, actually. I, I think it was a, 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 for me, it was a great advantage uh, because uh, just, especially having been on like different shows uh, for extended periods of time, I, I've just gotten to work with so many directors. And uh, uh, so I've gotten to kind of glean from those directors things that I, you know, that work to me and things that like, just even general vibes of set, like how, how do they how do they set the vibe? How do they set the tone? And, and how do they talk to actors? You know, I, and I, I could all I also got to see what didn't work and or what felt like oh that, that you know and, and usually actors will talk about that you know they'll be like oh that director was not you know? <laughs> um, uh, that director was awesome you know uh, uh, um, so yeah I thought in that in that regards it was always helpful but also. I was always curious uh, about the, the filmmaking side of things. So, so now I wouldn't just talk to the actors, but I would hang out with the DPs, hang out with the crew, hang out with kind of every aspect, the script supervisor. I would just kind of was really interested in that stuff. So, uh, so, so all those years, I, I just kind of really felt, by the time I got into directing uh, TV and eventually film, I felt like, oh, I, 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 I know the language now. I know, you know, I understand how it works. I've never done it before and I'm nervous, but, uh, but at least I have all that uh, uh, experience. That's all I had. Hi. Um, what is the process like because of rap novels and comics? You know, they have a very distinct, obviously, 2D look. Um, what is the process like going from that 2D to deciding is it going to be live action, is it going to be uh, 2D animated, is it going to be Fusion animated? I know when I'm watching my um, Warner Brothers like Batman, I'm always very interested whenever they decide to go CG instead of 2D. So for you all, like, did you have any say in the process or? Um, when you are reading an IP, you initially go, oh, I would love to see this as live action, or oh, I'd love to see this as two. Uh, I can answer a little bit on that. Um, I, I think a lot of those decisions were made at the, at the inception point. It's like, are you going to do this as an animated show, or are you going to do this as a claymation show? Is this going to be a live action show? And so once you do that, then it's a question of how setting tone and how real you want to be. Um, in the case of One Piece, we took stuff that was heightened and tried to make it as realistic as possible, um, including the visual effects. So we want you to believe that even though this is not our world, it felt like a world that's very similar to ours in a lot of ways. And so there's wear and tear and breakdown on costumes and sets and things like that. Um, and so, and, and then also we wanted the, the, the VFX to look very, very realistic. Um, and so that when you see the Lord of the Coast, it really looks like a sea beast, to sea creature that, that could exist if such creatures did exist. And so uh, a lot of it is, I think, just deciding really what kind of show you want to make, um, how surreal you want it to be, and how grounded. Well, for one piece, and then uh, to that, it was a really grand scale. Like, you built summarily, and um, like a grand scale, like huge. How do you decide what to kind of structure and what to create into 3D and, and sci fi, uh, like adding a, v, a VFX? Uh, element. Sure, that was um, uh, a cost decision, but also a, we made a very conscious decision to do as much in camera as possible. So mm -hmm. not to have actors on a blue screen or green screen stage doing their stuff and then filling it around them, but to actually build the ships, which we were able to do in South Africa. Um, 
and we appropriated a lot of the black sail ships uh, from that show in order to do that and then completely refurbished them to look like the One Piece ships. Um, and it did help, I think, that all of our actors would tell you that, and the, and the directors and the DPs, that standing on those ships really makes a difference as opposed to just building the deck of a ship on a stage somewhere. So what we could afford to do, we built as much as possible and then added CG elements to make things a little taller, a little wider, a little more fantastical in the background. Um, and of course, adding water because all those ships were in tanks or in a parking lot and none of them were on the open ocean. And we had to sell you know, the, the open ocean. And so that was a, a big VFX expense as well. Um, what do you feel? I feel bad. You guys can't really see them that well, so I'm like. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is for Mr. Maya. I wanted to ask you from the first season of One Piece, which would you say was your favorite character? And also, uh, what were some of your favorite aspects of how that character was brought over from the original source, how it became transformed into the new medium? Um, Luffy is one of my favorite characters ever of all time, but I'll, I'll tell you uh, an interesting one about Zoro, which is um, obviously the casting of Mikenyu was a huge deal in, in what that character became. Mikenyu is a very mannered and very quiet actor. Um, he does not emote a lot uh, mm -hmm. in, in playing Zoro, but when he does, it's wonderful and you can just kind of feel uh, the emotion coming from him. Um, and then, of course, having him, you know, he fights with three swords, one of which is in his mouth. And so that was something that we talked about a great deal because it, it could have looked ridiculous. And in the manga, it's the difference again between comic panels and real life. In the manga, you can show him doing a finishing move and he's got the sword in his mouth. And in reality, you have to fill in between all those panels and he has to have a fight that's choreographed by stunt people that looks like a real fight with a guy with a sword in his mouth. <laughs> it's tremendously challenging and lots of uh, trial and error and stuff like that. Um, but seeing that and seeing how well he handled the sword freed us up a lot and, and we were able to do things with his character and have him in scenes that um, he, he could pull off and not many other actors could. So when we uh, casted Matt, Sophia Rosinski, she's got frizzy hair out to here. She looks nothing like Matt, but she came in and, you know, for someone who's 13, she was an amazing, I mean, they're all amazing actresses, but I'm just speaking specifically about her. Um, you want someone who can tell the truth behind the character. And then you, then what we did is we went to great lengths, like we chopped her beautiful hair off, she had to straighten it every day. I mean, she was in tears because she didn't look like herself anymore, but um, she was back. But um, in terms of casting, um, you know, there's certain parameters you have to follow, you know, like, uh, like uh, you know, Cameron Jones had to be Tiffany. Um, but you gotta get the best actor or else, you know, as a director, um, it's just so much easier when you have someone who just is that person and it's just a lot, it goes faster. And Randall, you got Sherry Kula, I Love, and, and, and a whole bunch of uh, great actors. How did you decide for them that they are these characters that you, that you have? Oh, well, well, Sherry, it, I mean, is Alice, you know, like in so <laughs> many ways. And then, and uh, I, I, I already knew Sherry. She was a, a friend and, uh, and as soon as I, Came on board as a director, I was like, Sherry Hill, it would be great, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really, it, back to what Karen is saying, uh, just you're just trying to find great actors who are right for the part, and uh, and who, you know, particularly for, for Ben, Justin H. Min was just so, he brought so much of what was on the page and what was clear about the character, but 
there were things about the character that weren't necessarily in the script uh, that, you know, all of his opinions and t angry tirades and, and snarky comments, you know, they all came from this kind of place of heartache, you know, and sadness, and, and he brought that, you know. Uh, uh, so you're just trying to find actors who can bring what's, what's, what they're supposed to bring, but then also this, this whole life that happened before the project, the, the script starts, you know. And, uh, uh, and yeah, we, we found a, I'm really, really proud of the cast we found for the movie. I think casting is the most important job we have, is getting the right cast, because if you, if you bomb that, then you can have good scripts and good direction, and no one's gonna watch. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the Lemke's casting, that was the biggest thing that everyone was waiting for, because it's been not three years, we had people had fan fantasy lists and everything. How did you go through all of your kind of what you were looking for for these characters? And uh, we, we were looking for good actors primarily and actors who kind of embodied the characteristics of the characters. And also, we knew we wanted an international cast. And Odisan had very kindly drawn up kind of fans' wish lists of where the actors would be from if they were from our world. And so we used that as a starting point, um, certainly. And, we knew McKinney, or not McKinney, we knew Zorro had to be Japanese. We just knew it had to be. That was in, on his list, and yes. Um, for Luffy, we, uh, the specificity was Brazilian. We scoured Brazil, but then also decided to open it up and try to cast uh, an actor from Central and South America and found a Yaki Godoy, who was from Mexico and is wonderful. Um, and so as a start, that was our starting point. Uh, but it really, it was about getting the best actors that's kind of sad. I mean, if you don't do that, then you have nothing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question for Mr. Mr. Uh, for One Piece, I'm really interested in maybe providing more insight in like the sense and the fight uh, for you, because you know when you do have something in manga, the fights in Shonen particularly are very important to the fan bases. And sometimes, you know, if you want to speak to the advantages or disadvantages of having those fight scenes, like having these iconic moments that you need to transfer over to the screen versus what's capable for your stunt performers or for your stunt actors, and you know, that process of what it was like to look at that source content, or if your stunt performers didn't really look at the source content and just had instructions from you all on what to do. But yeah, if you can speak to that. Um, I, I think that they looked a fair amount at the source content, but at the end of the day, it wasn't about that. It was about what our stunt team could do and do with them. And so we had a, a really good process where so many of the stunts involved visual effects as well. And so the stunt team would do previous uh, choreography with camera. Um, and we had actually a dedicated cameraman who was part of the stunt team and who kind of did the dance with all the actors as they were doing this. And the actors, did a ton of the stunts themselves. Where we couldn't, we doubled them. Um, but it was about letting the stunt team run wild. And yes, we looked at the at the source material, but really it was about what can the stunt team do, what is possible in the physics of our world, and then also you know helping out with cables and things to be able to fly people and let them hover a little bit more than they normally would in a fight. So it was about doing a lot of previs, consulting the visual effects team early as to what parameters you were going to not be able to actually shoot, um, and you were going to have to enhance afterward and making sure that those were included and, and kind of catered to as well. Um, and yeah, fighting fights in are incredibly time intensive. Um, we'd shoot an entire day for like a minute of fight time. Um, and so if you're watching a four minute fight, that's four or five days of, <laughs> of just filming that fight. Um, it's, it's super time intensive, but, but worth it if you you know, we know it's an important part of the show, too. It looks great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was waiting, so I felt... No worries. <laughs> I just need to know what No, don't worry. <laughs> okay. So, um, this question is for all of the panelists. Um, hi, my name's Jalea. And um, we, we got some snippets of the answer to what I'm about to ask, but um, just a simple question. Um, of all the projects that you have mentioned here, like One Piece, Paper Girls, The Boys, and Shortcomings, um, who is your favorite character to work with, or just your favorite character in general, and why? That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay. Well, you know, you're asking me to pick. Yeah. You know, I, I will say like for the boys, um, Homelander, Anthony mm -hmm. Star. Okay, he's so darn good, and just to the director, he's intimidating because he's very good. He knows what he wants to do. He has a very good conception of his character. So I was petrified. Right? <laughs> you know, I was like, what are we gonna do? And, He's so kind and generous and asks questions and he he's obviously a collaborator and you know it's a real gift when you have someone who's such a great actor be that giving to somebody like me who shows up on a set for the first time, he doesn't know who I am. It's like, you know, it's it's really cool. And then on Paper Girls, um, you know, Cameron Jones who played Tiffany. I loved all the girls, they're sensational, but she was you know, Tiffany's is, I don't know if you guys know, she's just brainiac who dropped out of MIT and, by, and she invents time travel. Well, Cameron wanted to be Tiffany. So she's like studying, she has all these notebooks and stuff and that's kind of what I'm like. I'm, I'm not a genius, but I like having notebooks. But, um, you know, she's, she did her homework, she was very diligent, she was, you know, um, she took a couple notes because, she, you know, she's 12, you need notes, you know, it's, but, um, you know, I love all of them, but those are just two circumstances I just want to point out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's tough. That's tough to answer. <laughs> it's a tough one to answer, but I, 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 I mean, the whole, the whole cast, I, I felt like I, I just loved them so much. We we all bonded so much, you know, and, and we we were all so dedicated to to this. You know, we we all knew how that it was a special project that. I knew as an actor that roles like this don't come around for for us, you know, that often, and uh, uh, and so yeah, I can't, I, I can't like choose a character. I just love them all. Uh, but I will say that the character of Miko, played by Ali Maki, that was a very tough role to, to pull off, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know it, it doesn't kind of get the, the same press as the other roles, because the other roles are so, are so shiny and fun and interesting, but, uh, but she had a, uh, she did so much with that role and, uh, uh, and uh, really brought so much to that character that uh, wasn't, it wasn't even there to, you know, in the script, she just brought more to it. And, uh, and I was really blown away by, by what she did with that character, but, but really, uh, you know, I mean, Justin and Jerry, they were all just so great in their roles. Keith, who's your yeah. favorite child? Uh, <laughs> I, I loved the main cast uh, of the show, um, and they all brought such fascinating things to them. Uh, Emily is such a consummate professional, and McKenna, as I've mentioned, you know, had such a, a great badass demeanor and his fighting ability. Kaz spent, he, he came into the show, he started shooting late. Um, because of where Saji gets introduced, um, but he spent the entire time learning how to cook and, and stretching and doing kick training. And so he's so dedicated, and Jacob is so wonderful as well. And then Yaki, of course. Uh, I will pick a, another child, though, who I really <laughs> loved and who surprised the hell out of me at how good he was, and that was Aiden Scott, who was Hamako, um, and took a character that is kind of a joke and a throwaway sort of bully. Um, and because we had expanded the character in script, was able to take that character and actually make it someone that you like, <laughs> which was yeah. amazing to me. Um, so to watch him take this this kind of blustering bully and turn him into someone that was truly one of my favorite characters by the end of the show was really remarkable. I like how you guys picked like the villains, like I could fix them. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. <laughs> um, and then we have back there. Hi. Um, my question for you guys is just what that first meeting looks like where you sell your vision to the rest of the team and like how you get them on the same page. Like what, what are you using? Is it like mood boards? Is it um, like watching other films with people? Like how, how does the team come together uh, on the same page and like what do you use to kind of sell that vision? I mean, for me, it was my, my literally trying attempt to get hired to, to you know to direct the movie it was a it was a whole pitch and uh, I was very detailed in the pitch and I think the, the main thing that I uh, and, and the pitch was a, it was essentially a uh, um, what's it called 
what are those presentations like called? PowerPoint? Or, PowerPoint, yeah. 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 It, was, it, was <laughs> it was basically a PowerPoint, but it was all done online because, you know, the pandemic, and it was done over uh, Zoom. Uh, uh, um, but the, the main thing that, the main thing that I, I sold was how, why the story uh, meant so much to me, my history with the material, my uh, understanding of the material, and, uh, and, and, then, and then a lot of creative stuff, ways, shots, you know, ways in which I, I wanted to shoot it, uh, ideas for cast, you know, just kind of all those kind of things, actual filmmaking things, but, but the, the main thing was that emotional thing that we talked about earlier, uh, uh, making that very clear how much the story meant to me and how uh, 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 passionate I was about the, the project. And, and I, I really do think that aside from all the filmmaking stuff that, that uh, Helped certainly helped, and but also I knew it was going to evolve. You know, as we worked on it together, it was really that passion that that was going to kind of stay throughout, and uh, so so that was uh, that that was the, that was what I led with. Mm -hmm. Aaron, you want to like talk about Paper Girls and oh. Christopher? Um, well, um, you know, we had a template. It was the IP template of Paper Girls. It's pretty. Sp Specific. It's really wonderfully thought out. Um, so we had a template, but if we had an idea outside that template, um, we would verbalize it. We, since we had something to look at, we didn't need mood boards and stuff. But a lot can be said for passion. You know, it's like if you're passionate about your idea, um, and you can get the whole team on your side by being passionate and knowledgeable and enthusiastic and also collaborative. That has a lot to do with it too. If you want your vision on the screen, someone's got to help you. That's just the way it is. Yeah, I, I think you guys are both absolutely right. The first thing you're selling is, why me? You know, it's like, here's this great idea for a show that I think would be great, but this is why I'm the right person to tell this story. And you're selling your passion for the project. So, so important. And then the other part of it is why are you telling the story now? Um, mm -hmm. And what resonates? today. Um, but yeah, I, the first uh, selling point was pitching the show to Netflix and saying, hey, this is, we know you guys are familiar with the IP, but here's our vision of, of what the show is going to be, uh, and getting trying to get that green light to move ahead with the show. And the second thing, uh, which is really fun, is the first production meeting, which is in a large room with about this many people in it, and it's all the department heads, and just trying to, to introduce everybody to this huge show you're going to make and this huge undertaking you're about to embark on um, and getting people uh, familiar with the vision um, is, is at that point it's, it's fun for sure but challenging also. say you don't ever know for sure um, it's always a gut call and there's always a lot of discussion um, and so we had major discussions on the, the culture of one piece with Netflix's US team with their Asia team and then with uh, Otisan and the Shueisha team and so we, we were running the gamut across cultures of trying to determine what things should be in the show and what things could be okay to change, what things we needed to stick to the source material more. And it was never a, um, a black and white sort of discussion. It was always, hey, I think this is better storytelling. Let's do this. Oh, no, wait, that's really important to the Japanese audience to do this. Well, is that going to translate to the Western audiences as well? Um, so it was always a, uh, a discussion and a passionate, very passionate one at that. We have time for one more question. And I already said that we could let her go. My question is super brief, Mr. Landrill. How's Pam? <laughs> How's Pam? Pam? <laughs> <laughs> From the office. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, who's Pam? <laughs> That's how she's doing. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, thank you to the panelists for our event tonight. And thank you, thanks for putting this together. Uh, thank you all for coming here, so I really appreciate it. So thank you.
guys. Um, yeah, give it, give it to the guys. Okay, yes, thank you, that's all. <laughs> that's all.